Welcome to this uh, Lead the Business NPL3. My name is Siegfried Anderson. I'm the chairman of KF Anderson Leadership Academy. I started out in 1986. And we have three modules on Master of Business Leadership 1, 2, and 3. And this is the number 3. And it's called Lead the Business uh, based on my, uh, my, uh, my experiences over, uh, over the last many years. I learned that this about leading a business is not necessarily something that people do. Uh, I'd like to take your uh, attention here up to the third one, the interpretation between stabilizing growth and accelerated growth. Um, many, I know that many executives, um, they do uh, uh, it very difficult for themselves by using a stabilizing uh, concept for uh, growing the business. This will be very difficult because stabilizing is completely different from growing. But there's a solution for that, and this is some of the things that we actually train during the training. Uh, this is management, this is leadership, and this is in leadership. And uh, this is what we are, uh, uh, what we are talking about today. This is to stabilize, this is to scale. Uh, is the business model that you are using actually scalable? And up here, when we have a scalable model, then there's only one thing, and that's the next step, that is to accelerate that growth as much as you can. But that also means that we have to make sure that we get things right. So if the company is not scalable, the business model is not scalable, then everything becomes difficult. Um, that was a little bit of uh, this. Uh, I, the music, the piece of music you just heard was uh, Ola and die Freude, a tribute to joy and life. And it is the main topic through everything that I and we do in our my little company called KFNs and Leadership Academy. Why all this? Let me take you a couple of decades back in time. I had a collaboration with John P. Carter many years ago from the United States, and that was before he went out with his famous book called Leading Change. Some of the works that he actually did uh, before that was uh, this year that I described here. And uh, the reason why I take this here is because this very much reflects what I have experienced in my time uh, being a consultant, uh, being a coach for many CEOs and, uh, and uh, boards uh, around the world, by the way. And um, the discussion goes always about what's the benefit of developing people, uh, yes or no, and pro and contra. Uh, John P. Colley made this of shirts in the 80s, and it looked like this. Uh, first and foremost, we, for, uh, we focus on four things. This was Aris sales, Aris profit, Aris employed, and the Aris of value added for the shareholders. The interesting thing about this was that we have been, he had been made that over 12 years. So it was made for several hundreds, I can't uh, remember the exact figure, but several hundreds companies. And uh, he split about the two groups, uh, people who actually develop, companies that actually developed their people, and people, uh, companies who didn't do that. And what was actually the difference over 12 years? That was not just uh, watching figures, it was also to make a based on our interviews. But here we have it. So the undeveloped is this column, and the developed is this column. When I say developing all people, uh, there's a little twist on that. Primarily from the top, and then we taught the senior vice presidents across the companies to train, be able to train their people. And in that sense, we, they are able to, to train the whole company. That is what I mean with this all people. Let's take this average sales goes here after 12 years. These underworld companies have worked up for 106%. And uh, the comparable um, uh, company who actually developed ended up with 682%. This is both sustainable and extremely uh, convincing. Average profit from 1% over 12 years increase up to 756. So it, it, it pays off to involve, to involve people, all people, to develop the company. And that is the figures that speak for itself. Average employed, there's a lot of new jobs in this as well. 36% here, uh, 282 here, uh, which is also quite a lot of jobs. In this, these cases here, we talk about more than 100,000 jobs, but that's a different story. 
average value added to the shareholders, 74% here, 901% up here. That is outstanding. But that's also what we are aiming at. We are aiming at accelerating these figures. And how to do that? Here we have the next discussion, that is the difference between the purpose of gold and the means. The interesting thing about that is that many companies actually do this wrong. Because, as you usually say, growth, more profit, and more revenue. It's not what we are aiming at. That's a result, that's a consequence of doing a lot of things right. So it's not the, something that we're aiming at, it's a result. That is a consequence of what we have done in the past year. When we then look at that, then I have to twist it a little bit because I need to put something up that I can tell people so they got the understanding immediately. And that's this one up here. So the purpose for this training up here to receive all these figures here is, is to set up a compelling progress without boundaries. And that means one thing. We have to convince people that boundaries only exist up in people's brains, not in reality. When we then do that, then we take and discuss the next one, and this is what I call consistent marginal improvements consistently. Uh, the Japanese did, Toyota, and uh, many other companies around the world had something called uh, <coughs> marginal improvement consistently. I think it's exactly the same thing. And why that? Because it literally makes the whole organization much, much more reliable and uh, very and uh, flexible and whatever you can say here. And that's what we are actually doing here. So the goal for each senior <coughs> vice president in your company, in this company that we talk about, was exactly this. So we want to see consistent marginal improvements consistently. The way to do that, and here we have six dimensions of intelligence that I'm talking about here, is this grow fast or die slow strategy. First and foremost, I learned over the years that people, and they are very modest when they set up a strategy. What they literally do is just to make sure that the top executives in the company is actually able to deliver exactly what they promise. And for that reason, they do it very short term. What I'm talking about here is, for example, to double, <laughs> double, double, double in 10 years. That means that we double up in five years and then we double this result up one more time in the next five years. That is what I call a growth fast or die slow strategy. That also also means that if you don't fulfill this and follow that, then you are very, you'll get into problems. And that's the reason why I say, or die slow. So, grow fast or die slow. Strong, vibrant business culture, and that is the key. To build up the, and develop these uh, companies, we go after one thing, and that is to strengthen up the entire uh, uh, business culture so we make sure we get a very solid, vi very vibrant, and very flexible. And where we go in and discuss uh, what is actually the resistance to change. I learned over the years a very interesting thing. There's no organization who will have any resistance to change, but the, what I call the mental immune system defense in the organization, based on all the knowledge and all the cases and all the experience they have in the past, makes things different. Now that means that we have to put a block down and come up with a very strange message that says, if you take the past, into the present, you will forever spoil your future. That means that we need a flexibility that's built up on reality and new knowledge and new experiences and not the old one. And that's exactly that business culture. We have to impress customers. The most important customers we have to impress. Uh, and then we also have to inspire everyone else. But this focus on impressing customers is extremely important in relation to have a strong business culture. The people should intuitively have an experience of that this is a success and we're doing all the right thing all the time. So this is, <coughs> that's it, and a remark one thing, you call it a self-sustainable network organization. That means that we create an organization that is as flat as possible, 
Five layers is absolutely a maximum. Three layers is better than five. And then we have to lead people. People have to be led. And I still recall some of the discussion I have with these guys when I told them that now from now on, 40 people report to them. I say, how should I ever be able to control 40 people? And that's true. You'll never be able to do that. You should lead them. And that's a big difference. And that's how we do this here. So a network is built up on two things. That's professional skills has to be what I call exemplary. Their leading skills also have to be exemplary. When we do that, then there's only two things that actually pops up here. People who deliver and people who are able to uh, uh, show that they are very professional. These are the guys that will be natural leaders in this network. If you are not that skilled and you're not that exemplary, people, they will by themselves go away from you. The only one way to attract them, that is to inspire them as much as you can, and that was this up here. So this is what I call a self-sustainable network. Self-sustainable also means that this network here by itself creates the next talented people. People who are talented will actually push, for, push themselves forward, not just by themselves, but helped by all the people that work around them, and literally push them up and say, this woman, this man is the right one, man, man or woman to work for, and, and that's what I call self-sustainable. Self-sustainable responsibility is a completely different thing. I uh, eradicate any job description, and I, everyone in this organization can only get one job description containing two lines, create happy customers and nothing else. Uh, if people are saying, but I'm in production, I say, yeah, that's true, it's still your job description. Try to figure out how to do this. So <laughs> self-extending, and that also means another thing. Self-extending means the following. If I see that my, my colleague, he don't do the job that he was supposed to do, and he promised me to do, and if he don't do it, it's still my responsibility to get it done, so I do it for him. This is confrontation, yeah, that's true. But if people, they don't perform when we accelerate the business, we are all dependent on that each and every one do what they are supposed to do. And if they don't, they have to be confronted. And <clears throat> otherwise we have to take a discussion about how to actually get it done. That also brings me back to this up here with the network, uh, because uh, this of our people who pops up, uh, they only do that if they are able and have learned to be professional leaders. And that's, that's also an important thing. But the remarkable thing, it's not by his superior, it's by his colleagues. You say, this guy, he's the right guy. This lady, she's the right lady for that job. When they do this, then they pop up. And that is what we do here. That also means that people who are able to take upon and respond to things that don't get done will have a better chance to survive in that system than anyone else. The last thing here we do under the means is to do, we don't make what I call performance appraisal. We are aiming much higher than that. We are aiming at task spectacular well done. And that is what we, that means each and every one Every team in the organization is, is evaluated on this. When I eradicate performance appraisal, I have to replace some, uh, place it with something else. And that is called team evaluation. That means me and my team, my colleagues on my level, same level as me and my boss, they evaluate my team's performance, not me but my team's performance. I go back to my team and said, come on, I got a performance <coughs> rank by my boss on 50, when 100 is the best. We have a problem. Not me, but we have a problem. That means I make each and every a performance evaluation, a team performance evaluation. That means that the team have to help each other out of that situation. Not me, but the team. Yes, I am responsible, that's true. And I'll definitely make sure it happens. And that is exactly this, what this is about here. So we go for spectacular jobs well done. 
This is the, <coughs> the concept. What is then the consequence of all this? First and foremost, the consequence is this. Limitless growth, effortless executed. The point is here that we involve each and everyone in that development. It's not just the leaders. It's not just some special guys uh, sitting in special ivory towers or wherever they are. It is this. This is the only way you can do it. As I usually say, to make this happen, we're only working on what I call a bottom-up approach. We can never work on a top-down approach that we simply not work. Because as soon as people they feel suppressed or neglected or whatever, it will not work. So we have to involve each and every one, and that is called inclusiveness. And one of the things out of these five things I put up here, uh, six things I put up here, is what we get out of that situation. The company will end up by being a compelling growth outlier. What does that mean? Outlier means one thing. Your company is second to none. And second to none means there's a long distance down to number two. That means that we try to eradicate the discussion about who is more competitive than who. And the point is here that we literally hate competition because we are so good at what we are doing that we literally made a new industry standard for how we deliver and how we develop and how we do everything. And that makes a big distance down to number two. We are working here on what I call an evolutionary, exemplary conduct team inclusiveness. This team inclusiveness is something that we go through on module two, elite team leadership. And that is this about including. That means when you become a team leader, you forever forget your ego. Now it's all about the team and nothing else. That actually means that the senior vice presidents here in this company end up being team, team, the team of team leaders, including the executive team, team of teams. This is what we are aiming at here, and we, we take this evolutionary, exemplary conduct to be able to do that. That is something you have never heard about before. You have never tried it before. And the point is that the best companies that I am working for, I work together with, this is a very keen and a very essential success factor, building up a strong and vital business culture. Number three, foster elite team leaders. That means that this system here, some of your leaders, senior vice presidents and leaders in the middle management, they will be very attractive for all the companies around you, especially your competitors, they are looking for that. But here we build up an elite team leaders, that means we are glued together like what I call one day old spaghetti. Yes, I can go out of this company, maybe even get 10,000 bucks more per year, or maybe even 100,000 bucks per year, but if I do that, then I end up in a lousy company together with lousy colleagues, I don't want that, so I better stay in this company. That is this. How to do that? Good profit to all shareholders. No, no, no. Stakeholders. Not shareholders. Stakeholders. What does that mean? Yeah, that means when we become an outlier, we'll probably make so much money, as I showed you up here, that we can't continue in doing that without spreading some of the profits out to all of us who is involved in doing that. That means, first and foremost, the customers. Yes, that's true. That means that, yes, despite we are very aggressive in price setting, we are also discussing cost cutting as much as we can just to make sure we get this right. It means that we can actually lower our cost and even make more profit. And that is one of the points. Here, when we do that, then it's an advantage for the customers. Then we make it an advantage for the employees who is involved in that. Then we make uh, it for all our suppliers who is actually delivering into us. We make a partnership with them and we share some of the profit to them. And that means that we end up here being winners all of, all of us, both shareholders, both customers, both <coughs> uh, employees and the local community. The local community who actually support us all the way through we also give some of this back to them, and that's what I call good profit to all stakeholders. Can that be done? Some of the most successful companies in this world actually do that already.
Randy. I have done that for more than 20 years, just for information. Supreme Innovative Solutions. This is about supreme innovative solutions. It's something, a concept that goes right over to this up here, what, what we call uh, consistent marginal improvements consistently. We never stop improving. And by doing that, we end up in the industry, in our branch, to have the most supreme innovative solutions for whatever pops up. This is a part of how we would like to work. And this is a consequence of doing all this right. We'll end up right here. Liberate people for growth, well-being, and comfort. Liberating people means, as I mentioned before, we put them in a network. There's no hierarchy. Yes, there is a hierarchy. But the hierarchy is built up upon professionalism and a leading. Who deliver? These three things, nothing else. And uh, when we do that, each and every one is actually ending up acting like a leader. So each and every one takes the lead when it comes to this. And that is what I call liberate people for growth, well-being and comfort. Well-being, yes, that's true. It's a misunderstanding. If you go in and look up an Oxford Dictionary 100 years ago, you will see the word well-being <coughs> a very interesting thing. Well-being means that you always challenge yourself as much as you can. That's a well-being. I call it the classic definition of well-being. Same with comfort. Point number one in comfort in the Oxford Dictionary classic understanding of comfort is that you always use your strength. You can look it up if you doubt what I'm talking about. But in our time, these two words are completely twisted <coughs> about what I call the social media and whatever comes up, television and so on. So we work for three things. We liberate people based on growth, well-being and comfort. And growth is up here. You're welcome to do the same thing. I have done it before. I know how to do it. And I can definitely help you out if you want to. And that's exactly what we trained here on Module 3, Lead the Business. I will very much look forward to welcome you on this training.